Doll E3, Jumping Robots, Misleading Titles on Presentations, A No Fluff Just Stuff event, Gradle Providers and Properties, My Blog is Finally Back, and the usual collection of silly tweets, toots, and skeets. All of this and more on this week's Tales from the Jar Side. Welcome to this week's newsletter. The title is basically as I read it, Tales from the Jar Side with the Dolly 3 part and the rest. The subtitle this week is my son saying, Dad, I'm cold. And my reply is, go stand in the corner. There, it's 90 degrees. Welcome, fellow Jarheads, to this week's Tales from the Jar Side newsletter, the Cousin IT newsletter for the week of October 8th through 15th. 2023. This week I taught my practical AI tools for Java developers course as a no fluff just stuff virtual workshop basically for the first time. I also gave several talks, five as a matter of fact, at this weekend's no fluff just stuff event in Reston, Virginia. If you're not familiar with it, Reston is a suburb of Washington, D.C. Regular readers of and listeners to, and of course, video viewers of this newsletter are affectionately known as jarheads and are far more intelligent, sophisticated, and of course attractive than the average newsletter reader or listener or viewer. If you wish to become a jarhead, then please subscribe using the button in the newsletter or on kencousin.substack.com. This is our opportunity to take a look at the YouTube channel, the companion YouTube channel, and see how it's doing. Here is the channel this week at youtube.com slash at tales from the jar side i'm up to 816 subscribers which is great i broke 800 i'm pretty happy about that everything is listed there now what's different this week is that while i did get the newsletter video out of course i had so many other things to do this week i didn't get an additional video out on a technical topic or anything like that so expect things this coming week and in the future but this week was a little tight so I'm not going to spend extra time on this channel. Let me just go back to the newsletter itself. The first topic reflects a change that happened inside of my chat GPT subscription. And this was basically available like the day before or the evening before my No Fluff Just Stuff presentations. And that is, is that if you go to chat.openai.com, you can now ask for Dolly 3. Version 3 of Dolly is a huge gain over Dolly 2. Now, I happen to have that available. Let me show you this. So this is chat.openai.com. And if you look under GPT-4, in the past couple of weeks, they've added this browse with Bing part, which, yeah, okay. I mean, it's better than dealing with data that's all a minimum of two years old, because that's when ChatGPT stopped its training. There's the advanced data analysis part, which is the part that will generate Python code as needed and create plots and things like that. There's a whole section that allows you to enable, I believe it's a maximum of three plugins at a time, but it's kind of hard to find out what the good plugins are. That's a different issue. And here's the new one, Dolly 3. So if I click on that, then now I am dealing with Dolly 3 and I can put in a request. Now let me show you one I did recently. The prompt was a photorealistic image of a happy robot jumping on springs for the spring framework. That's what I was headed with that. Thrilled that he accomplished a hard task. And as you can see here from the output, it says Dolly 3 created four images. Let's see if I can magnify that a bit. That looks like a pretty happy robot, and it's actually jumping on a spring. I mean, that's way better than what I had before. Let's see this one, again, jumping on springs, even better. Very happy about that. This one, too, looks like a very happy robot. That's good. And finally, that one. Now, I actually generated four other images and said regenerate again, and they all look very, very good. I'm quite happy with it. I, I'm very impressed. Now, this is in dramatic contrast to what you get from Dolly 2. And if I go back to the newsletter, what I have here is a picture that was generated by Stable Diffusion, 
which I used in through a Discord server. Now, it, usually with Stable Diffusion, you use it through its Discord server. There's also a programmatic API from something called PicoGen that I can use to access it. That will be the subject of a future video because it's a third-party thing. It's a RESTful web service. It's got its own quirks and complications. We'll get to that. This one was another one from that same run, just getting some another robot, although there's not much jumping going on in that one. I don't think that prompt said anything about springs either. The prompt was a realistic photo of a happy robot leaping into the air in joy after accomplishing a particularly difficult task. I'm not great at these prompts. I'm more interested in just accessing it as a RESTful web service than the details of the prompts, but okay. This one was from Mid Journey. And Mid Journey has been for some months now by far the best image generator out there. But Mid Journey, as I say, you come from a Discord server. Now, Stable Diffusion, I, I said came from a Discord server, and that's true, but that one actually does have a RESTful API, and I did do a video on that earlier. So that one's slightly different. That one I do have a video about, there'll be more in the future. But Mid Journey, that's the one where I have to go through this separate thing called. PicoGen in order to get anywhere with it. So OpenAI one was all Dolly 2. Now Dolly 2 was rather revolutionary when it first came out. I mean, nothing was anywhere near like that back in, I don't know, spring, maybe earlier this year. I mean, that's how recent these things are and how quickly they're changing. And you see there's a robot and that was the, that was probably the best of several different use cases. And that's about all we had. So I've been waiting eagerly for Dolly 3 to be available. Unfortunately, the problem with Dolly 3 right now is I can only access it through either Bing Chat, and I don't want to go through Bing Chat. I'm not a Microsoft person. I do have a Microsoft account, but I try not to use it very often. But now again, it's available through the website chat.openai.com, as I just showed you. So this is a picture of what I showed you on the website, just to give you an idea what's now possible. And I hope to use that some more and looking forward to using it in the future. From my point of view, the real question is, when will this be available in the programmatic API? And there's a discussion forum, but the OpenAI people don't tend to reply much on the discussion forum. The forums seem to be a lot more for the users to talk to each other than anything else. There has been no information about when the changes will be out, when the new version will be there. However, there is a conference slash, you know, marketing day available. It's called, let's magnify that a bit, Open AI Dev Day, which is a one day conference on November 6th of 2023. We look forward to bringing together developers from around the world to explore new tools and exchange ideas, whatever. I have signed up to be notified so I can watch the live stream, at least of the keynote, and find out what, what they announce. I expect there'll be a lot of announcements at that, and hopefully part of that will be the developer API. So let me close that. So that's what I'm really waiting for, is the big dev day on November 6th. And I'll, of course, put in the newsletter what comes out of that. Let's move on to the next topic. As I mentioned, I taught that training course called Practical AI Tools for Java Developers. This was a no fluff, just stuff virtual workshop, as they say. Unlike my previous talk, which I gave at UberConf, that was back in July when I was still getting my, getting my bearings under me on this, uh, getting my bearings, I suppose that's the right way to say it, but I'm still getting used to the APIs and everything. This time, I really focused on the code part of it rather than the actual AI tools necessarily which I'll come back to, because I did the same thing at my two-part talk at the No Fluff event. Unfortunately, while I thought the developers would be far more interested in the code than the tools, the title sounds like I'm talking more about the tools. Now, in the actual workshop, I put in an updated description, and let me show you that. Here's the actual web page for the next time I'm going to deliver the workshop, since, I mean, the last one already passed, so they don't have the page immediately available. And you can see it's a half day training, blah, blah, blah. And if you scroll down, you could see that I actually have an outline here that talks about the OpenAI API and Java tools and image generation and listing the models, connecting to ChatGPT, 
using whisper transcription for audio, stable diffusion, etc. So this one I really did focus on the developer side of it, and there was only one small section about various tools, and I, in that I was talking about the Java things like records and the HTTP client API and authentication and text blocks, all of that. When I did the virtual workshop this week, the developers seemed okay with it. I don't know if they were all looking for that, but they were seemed all right. The problem I had is I actually had my internet access drop for a good 10 minutes in the middle of the workshop. It took me a little while to figure out that I really needed to change to using my phone as a hotspot. And once I did that, then I was able to rejoin and we're and go on and it was still fun and everything i mean the talk was you know that that went pretty well and i didn't get a lot of evals for it but the ones i did all seemed to be pretty positive about it now on saturday however in that let me show you the outline for that event this isn't exactly what it looked like because again everything has changed since the session is now over but in my practical AI tools for Java developers, you'll notice I did in fact open or update the API here. I listed the outline with all the classes I was going to talk about, and it's basically the same stuff. What I had not updated, however, was this description. And here I mentioned GitHub Copilot and IntelliJ's basically AI Assistant, VS Code, GPT-4, all of these pieces. Now, I was pleasantly surprised when I got a bunch of attendees in the first of the two sessions. And I was kind of disappointed when in the second of the two sessions, only a handful of them came back for the second one. Now, I don't know, there were probably, there's probably another talk going on at the same time for the second one that probably mattered. But I later realized, kind of halfway through the second one, that I think people were more expecting to focus to be on tools rather than on the API and the technology. And that's really unusual for me to misjudge like that, but that did happen. And it explains a lot. Now, the complication that happened in the first one, and I actually do have one thing in the newsletter about it. So let me go back to the newsletter and let me let me say this the way I wanted to say. At the event on Saturday, I was scheduled for two back-to-back -back sessions on the same topic. My updated description was close to what I did, but I just realized I hadn't updated the description on the conference talk. And I realized they were looking forward to the more information about the tools. And during that talk, I realized that the questions that they were asking cared more about the tools. So I adjusted, I did go with that, but I felt kind of bad that I missed that in the first talk. And then I mentioned the big thing here. <laughs> I noticed there was a handful of attendees in like the second row of the group that were really distracted by something. And I said, what's up, what's going on? And it turned out it was raining all day on Saturday and they actually started getting some drips from the ceiling. It looked like there was some water actually dripping in from the ceiling. And in fact, you could see those ceiling tiles kind of bowing inward and people were really getting nervous. So they we paused for a minute and they moved their tables around and so be it. But it was like, oh goodness. And when I was telling my friends later, like Venkat Subramaniam, his immediate reaction was, did you make a joke about waterfall development? And I, I'm still kicking myself that it didn't occur to me <laughs> to make a waterfall joke about this. So, of course, I went back to GPT-4 and I explained what happened and said, OK, what joke should I have said or what should I have said? And GPT-4 said, oh, that would have been a prime moment for some light humor. I can't seem to make that any bigger. And it said what I should have said, something like, ladies and gentlemen, which is already off. That's not me at all. It appears we have some real-time feedback from nature on development methodologies. I guess the weather is trying to tell us to steer clear of waterfall and move toward agile. Anyone up for some pair programming with an umbrella? It would make light of the situation while tying it back to software development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, don't give up your day job. I mean, it's. I was hoping for some decent puns, and occasionally it'll come up with some that one is that's a blunt instrument you know and humor is always so subtle and subjective so yeah i didn't make a gag and i'm still not exactly sure what the right gag is i was going to say something like despite the obvious cue from mother nature even that's a little too formal 
I still don't suggest we switch to waterfall development and waited, or probably more my style would have been something like, oh, I need my uh, rim shot for that. There we go. Probably more my style would have been something like, I know there's a waterfall joke in there somewhere, but I can't quite find it. That I could have lived with. I just, but either way, I didn't come up with anything. Now the event, the way the event worked out, I had two talks on latest features in Java, and I spent a lot of time in the first talk talking about streams and lambdas and method references. And I'm always a little worried about that because, I mean, that's almost 10 years old at this point, and I keep thinking I should just cut that out. And yet I get a ton of questions from people about that about functional programming. I try to talk about it at a somewhat more advanced level, like pointing out the differences between building something into the infrastructure versus using it as part of the API. As an example, if you've ever looked at the for each method that was added to map. Now this is not a functional programming feature necessarily, but it does show the trend of the for each method is implemented as a default method in the map interface and that is the how to iterate over a map, whereas you just provide a by consumer and you say what to do with the keys and the values, and then it will do it. And this separation between what you want to do and how to do it is very much part of the trend in Java, especially with functional programming features. So I bring that up. I did get one person at the end saying, you know, it would be nice if we hadn't spent so much time on the basic stuff, and I get that. So we'll have to see how I handle that in the future. On the other hand, I did go into most of the things that have come up since then. By the end of the second talk, we had talked about records and the HTTP client and sealed interfaces and pattern matching for switch and all those things. Didn't get time to do anything with virtual threads, but we'll see. Tomorrow, I actually have a no fluff, just stuff virtual workshop on latest features in Java. And I've updated the GitHub repository for that too. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, now, although I guess the one lesson I really need to learn from the experience I had at the event is that if I could separate out my own emotional reaction from the overall thing, it's that, you know what, there, there is a big audience out there for a talk on the actual tools for Java developers. Now, most of the AI tools I use are not specifically for Java developers, but I use the AI Assistant all the time. I use it for generating commit messages constantly. I love that because I don't like writing Git messages and it does a good job with that. I use it for refactoring. I do sometimes use it to suggest ways to um, give me documentation for my code or for picking ways to rewrite it. I guess that's part of refactoring. At any rate, I, I do have conversations with it and that does seem to be helpful. I have to decide what else to bring in that I can talk about even though it's not Java. Like Things like the Whisper transcription tool for generating the subtitles for all of my talks I use here. We'll, we'll see. I'm going to have to see how I'm going to play that in the future. Let's move on to our next section. The other big thing I had going on this week is I had a two-day intensive private course on Gradle. Now, the, the thing is, I have been using Gradle for more than 10 years. I mean, probably 12, 13, 14. I remember when I was waiting for Gradle to go to version 1.0. I mean, this came out of the Groovy ecosystem, and I started playing with Groovy pretty intensively around... I'm guessing 2008, somewhere around there. And Gradle was one of the projects to come out of that. It was the, the replacement for Gantt, for Groovy Ant at the time. And I really liked it. I've used Gradle for all of my books. You know, every book that I wrote that had code in it, you know, that has a Gradle build file in it. And it's part of the reason I learned Kotlin, because when Gradle decided to adopt a Kotlin DSL, I thought that's another reason to learn it in addition to Android, which is where it's the definitive build tool. So I've been using Gradle for a long time. Also, Gradle, the company, used to be called Gradleware. Now it's called Gradle Incorporated. They, t they had a free training class, a free introductory training course, Introduction to Gradle, that they taught online every other month. And for about four or five years, I was the one who taught that class. This is all way, my way of saying, I feel like I should understand it by now. You know, I, I really should be 
if not an expert, because that's a that's a special term. I, I tend to reserve that for people who really, really know it. At least I ought to be pretty good at it by now. And yet, during that course, I keep running into things that I kind of know but don't really know. It's a, it's a question of depth. It's a question of how well do you really know something. And sometimes just knowing it at the basics isn't enough. You really have to go layer after layer. And one of the things that Gradle has introduced over the last few versions is this idea of providers and properties. They have a section in the Gradle user manual called lazy configuration here. And this gets into the way they make it so that the performance comes because they can avoid tasks. And one way to avoid configuring or creating tasks is to use providers and properties. You could write output properties as in, of one task as input for another. You can wire together properties without winding up doing work during configuration phase. And they have all this detail on how to do it. And they, they've got examples here like someone making, let's make that a little bit bigger. This is an example of creating your own custom task in Gradle. And I'm on the Kotlin DSL, and you can see they make it an abstract class, extending default task. We have a property of type string, and getting a value provide, gives you a provider of type string, and working with all that. And I never used to write that way. I never used to care about it, especially because if you look in the Groovy DSL, Yes, they still got properties and providers, but in many cases, you could just write a string, you know, <laughs> and you don't have to go through these properties and providers. Is it better to go through properties and providers? Probably. No doubt the Gradle people would say yes, and it probably will get you better performance and everything. But for years, as someone who was inst an instructor for these things, I always kept it as simple as possible. The whole explain it to me like I was a fifth grader thing. You know, I always emphasize that. And the problem with that is that when I create these things, I get pushback from the experienced Gradle people saying, yeah, but you're doing it wrong, you know? And that's what was coming up during the training class, not from the attendees really, but from when I went into the documentation and we'd see things like that. And they'd say, oh, you really, what's this about properties and, and providers and why do we care and on and on. And it was a reminder that while I'm familiar with it, I don't really understand it. And that was hard on me. I really had to do a lot of scrambling to make up for that. Now, part of this is my own fault. On the YouTube channel, you know, the Tales from the Jar Side YouTube channel, I have a playlist on Gradle here. Mm. I didn't mean to start that. Inside the playlist, I have a video, again, Did I don't want it to know? play, but I'll just bring it up here, called a Gradle Zip, Unzip, Hooray, Zip, Unzip, and Jar with Gradle. And during that video, I talk about how to create a jar file and, or a zip file, an archive, and then unzip it inside Gradle using the copy task. And I did that with just the regular code without actually taking advantage of providers and properties. And when I did that, then I got some feedback from one of the experienced Gradle users. I mean, Cedric Champeau said, you know, there's a better way to do it. And in the GitHub repository associated with that, which is this repository right here, Gradle Zip Unzip Demo, you can see I have a Groovy module and a Kotlin module. And in the, in the Groovy module, everything is really simple. I make an unzip jar task of type copy and I just say, oh, it's the archive file from the jar task and I say where to put it and we're good. And then on the Kotlin module, however, I wound up writing this complicated code that's here commented out. You can see from zip tree task dot named zip dot get, because that's from the provider, and archive file dot get as file. And Cedric said, you know, you could simplify it to a map with an archive file and all this. And so I've updated the repository, but this is all stuff that I get, but I don't really get. I mean, I really need to go over it again. And this is all an elaborate way of pointing out that I need to go through this stuff again. That while I understand it, I don't understand it at enough depth, enough of an understanding to really get it across 
to the people who need to know about it. And as I mentioned, I had a paragraph here that I, I've been through this before. That video was made back in July, which isn't really all that long ago. And yet I didn't take the opportunity to go through all this in detail back then. I mean, I suppose this is a good thing. It's just, I feel like I've been using Gradle long enough. I don't expect to have gaps like this again all the time because they keep changing things. Oh, well, it makes me feel like I don't understand it on a regular basis. And that's kind of frustrating. But I didn't get a bunch of objections or anything. Nobody seemed to object. It's just it's my own feeling of it, feelings of inadequacy, I suppose. Oh, well, let's move on to another section. Now, this is a bit of a story as usual. Uh, for several years, I wrote regularly on my blog, and I it's a WordPress blog. It's hosted at WordPress.com, but I created the custom URL, the custom domain of CousinIT.org specifically for the blog. So if I was to go over there, this is what the blog looks like. I'm probably going to play around with the user interface again, but you can see that when I did a groovy podcast, that always showed up here. But if I look at other things, you know, I talked about Spring's query for stream method, but in general, I haven't done much with this at all. Gradle parallel tests. It's been a long time since I really updated it. That was from back in 2020. And what I had done is I was about to let my subscription to WordPress here, the one that did everything, I was about to let that lapse and go, yeah, you know, I'm really not doing much with this. The combination of tweeting or social media in general and this newsletter, you know, and the fact that I actually also have a, a Medium account as well, kind of change things. Here's my Medium one, by the way. That's a link in here as well. The reason I started using Medium is I wrote a couple books for Pragmatic Programmers, and Pragprog has a publication here. So I wrote a whole series of Medium posts generally around the books so that I could be part of the Pragmatic Programmers publication. So that was that. And again, that gave me all my reason for publishing on my own blog was kind of going away. So with all that in mind, I wasn't going to renew. And I thought I'd actually gone in the settings and stopped the auto renew from happening only to get an email saying, okay, thank you for auto renewing. And I'm like, wait, what? So I was tempted to go in and stop it. And then I thought, you know, maybe it wouldn't be a bad thing to resurrect that blog, especially because they made an announcement at WordPress that now it generates a Fediverse like Mastodon feed. You actually have a feed from your blog that you can subscribe to inside of Mastodon. And last week I talked about how I moved to fuj.social on Mastodon for my, my Mastodon participation. FUJ, again, as a reminder, stands for Friends of Open JDK, Friends of the Open JDK Project. And I thought, okay, well, if they're going to participate in it, then let me go into my WordPress blog and make it so that, first of all, they're connected to Mastodon. So when I do make a post, it shows up in my regular feed as a note. But also now you can subscribe to the feed Let's see, it's fuj.social slash at cousinit at cousinit.org. <laughs> so that little mechanism, the at cousinit slash at cousinit.org, that's part of Fuj Social. And this will actually be a feed you could add to your Mastodon follows. You know, it's something that you follow and you'll get the new blog posts. So I made a post to see what they would look like. And it's not perfect because what it tells me is if I try to embed code in there, even if it looks okay here, in fact, this was the blog post, the spring with chat GPT. And here I mentioned, see, I tried to embed a little bit of code in here. And then there's a video, there's the video I was talking about. And I kept it short and just to see what it would look like. Well, the code doesn't look great in the Mastodon feed because you, you lose the highlighting, but it did come up. So I'm going to have to toy with how I'm going to wind up doing this. I did put in all these links and stuff and, and you can subscribe and we'll see how that goes. I'll probably take some of my older videos and write brief descriptions of the lessons learned or the thing to talk about in there. In fact, I was thinking 
this is one thing that, that GPT is good at, is that you can have GPT summarize videos for you and give you bullet points. And I was thinking that would be perfect to put inside a blog post so that people could say, I'm not sure I want to watch this video or not. And here's a post that would have the bullet point summaries to tell you exactly what's in there. We'll see. If you think that's a good idea, please let me know. Let's move on. Here are our tweets and toots and skeets, oh my, you know, everything else. Uh, first thing I mentioned is that Kay Horseman, the indefatigable Kay Horseman, author of the Core Java series and a long time professor in, and taught Java for, I don't know, 30 years or more. Well, not 30 years, but at least 25. <laughs> uh, put out another blog post. And this blog post was called Stop Using Char, the primitive type, in Java and Code Points. And he says, as I'm editing the 13th edition of Core Java, I realize I need 13th edition, you believe it? I need to tone down the coverage of Unicode Code Points. I used to recommend readers avoid char and use Code Points instead, but I came to realize that with modern Unicode, Code Points are problematic too. Just use string, which I'm really glad to hear because all I ever use is string anyway. I have no idea why it's got a People magazine cover on it. But if you read through some of this, he starts talking about Unicode and code points, the Java API for code points, and good old, oh my goodness, grapheme clusters, whatever the heck that is, you know, grapheme clusters, and on and on. And so just use strings. And I loved hearing that. And of course, he's got like flags and other emojis in there. And it was a really good article, as all of his are. But it was another reminder of there's entire continents of stuff that I'm supposed to be technically an expert in where I know little to nothing. <laughs> now, maybe I'm OK, because if all he wants me to do in the end is use strings, yeah, that I can do. <laughs> But I do need to go through this blog post again and see what it is he was talking about in some detail. I just hope I don't hear the term grapheme clusters again anytime soon. Here was a really bad dad joke, much like the, much like the one I did in the subtitle up at the top. It says, your body's run out of magnesium. And the response is, OMG, but it's actually zero, zero. MG, the chemical symbol for magnesium. So, okay, fine, you know, dad joke. How about this one? Time zone troubles. It was an image, that part of somebody's toot. It said days since last time zone issue, minus one. Oh boy, do I understand that. I have to teach a class in November in Phoenix. And I have to teach it like the week after we go off daylight saving time in the Eastern time zone. And Arizona doesn't do daylight savings. So I got to tell you, I'm still not exactly sure what time it'll be when I have to do my training class that evening on the O'Reilly platform. I mean, I'm like, what hour, what hour is it exactly? And, you know, it's just time zones. You know, you say they say that you could always tell a developer by whispering the word time zone in their ear and watching a shutter go down their spine. And yeah, I get that. This, I think, was not intended specifically for ChatGPT. It was actually in an archive, but it's a perfect ChatGPT joke. It has an interviewer saying, what's your biggest strength? And me, I'm an expert in machine learning. So skip those two parts and assume we're talking to GPT. Interviewer, what's seven plus nine? Me, zero. Interviewer, no, it's 16. Me, okay, 16. Interviewer, so what's 10 plus 20? Me, 16. I mean, absolutely. You know, that's a that's a chat GPT joke just waiting to happen. So at any rate, that's a good one. This popped up in my feed as well, and it's seriously a dated joke. I mean, on multiple scales, but I thought I'd include it anyway. It's a pencil-like drawing of Picard and Riker, and Riker saying, what is happening to us? And Picard says, we're having an aha moment. Yeah, and if you don't get it, then okay, you have something in, in, amusing to watch. It's a reference to this really old aha hit, Take On Me, but more importantly, it's about the video. And the video is famous, you know, and I put in the video, I embedded it here, but you can watch it on YouTube, remastered in 4K and everything. It's basically a classic one-hit wonder. 
the Norwegian band AHA and how they made this take on me video and they go in and out of pencil drawings and come out. It's, it's very clever. It was highly revolutionary way back in good old 1986, won a, won a bunch of awards. I remember when it came out, of course. And while I know that's dated, heck, just using Picard and Riker in a joke is dated, right? But I have a feeling most of the people who read my newsletter will, will get it immediately. If you check that video, you'll see it has nearly 1.8 billion views on it uh, with a B. No harm in adding a few more. My wife had not seen the video, so now she's seen that. Moving on. I titled this, Are You Going? Because the, I think this might have actually been a tweet. It said, I love the song Scarborough Fair because it follows my favorite poetic structure, Nosy question, are you going to Scarborough Fair? Grocery list, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. And haunting personal information. Remember me to one who lived there. She once was a true love of mine. I mean, you know, it. it go ahead through the music. And in fact, that's even older than I'm saying. I mean, there's the Simon and Garfunkel song is from 1965. So that's a long time ago. The original Scarborough Fair music and and lyrics and everything date back at least to 1670 <laughs> and the fair itself goes back hundreds of years before that as well so let's really move way way back but at least now maybe you're thinking about that song rather than take on me you know take me on this was great uh it said finally cats it says i'm pretty sure my asshole cat knew i was high af last night when he decided to mess with me and you could see if you stare at this picture that the Meow Mix has a cat head on it and the person's cat is basically got their head behind the bag and it's lined up perfectly like that. Just messing with you. That would be amazing. Have a great week, everybody. And last week I did, as I mentioned, the Practical AI Tools for Java Developers Workshop and my Gradle class and, of course, the one at Trinity and the No Fluff Just Stuff Symposium. That's why I didn't have a technical video this week. This week I'm back to a more comfortable schedule. I'm doing my latest features in Java, one I mentioned. That's coming tomorrow and the Trinity class. But I do hope this time to do a technical video of some kind and maybe if I can arrange it, a live stream. We'll have to see whether people's schedules fit that or not. I'm still not sure. But this latest features is updated for 21. Hope you have a good week and there will be links to other features there and you know other videos you might be interested in. Hope to see you again next week. Take care everybody. that never ends.